Um, thank you so much, Allison, for joining us. Uh, so I'll read the little blurb that you sent me about CPH. Um, more than 1,000 professionals have become certified in public health, CPH. The CPH is increasingly recognized across the country and around the world. A commitment to CPH demonstrates leadership in public health. The CPH certification process is an accurate measure of an individual's mastery of the core professional domains of public health. The CPH certification responds to heightened societal requirements for professional accountability in public health and calls for standards for competence in the field of public health. It benefits the public by assuring the professional currency and ongoing accountability of CPH professionals through continuing education and professional development. So today we have with us today, special guest, Allison Foster, and she's gonna tell us more about becoming CPH certified. And uh, first we'll hear from Allison and then we'll open the floor to everybody else for any questions that you might have for her. And you should be able to share your screen if you have something to share on your screen, Allison. Okay. All right. Thank you, Samantha. Yeah. So, um, hi, I'm Allison Foster. I'm the president of the National Board of Public Health Examiners. Um, and my apologies in advance, My both of my kids are going to come rolling in in a minute, and they're probably going to come over here and talk to me. So you might see some little people in the background. That's how it is these days, right? All right. So let me see if I can share this. All right. Good. Okay, so um, so I'm gonna. I know it's you know evening, and you all probably have things to do. So I'm gonna try to get through the content of this in about 35, 40 minutes. I'm gonna go a little quickly, but we'll have plenty of time at the end if you have any questions. I just I love certification so much. Sometimes I can talk maybe more than you want me to. So I'm gonna keep it a little succinct. Um, so the National Board of Public Health Examiners is a nonprofit organization that offers the CPH credential and coming soon, um, other credentials. Um, so our board of directors um, is comprised of individuals from um, lots of different public health organizations. We really represent the gamut of public health. We have accreditation and academia and health departments, membership organizations, et cetera. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a bit about the history, but to date we've had, it's actually, I think it's a little closer to 13,000 folks have taken the CPH exam. Um, and just a little side note, um, though most of our candidates are in, in the United States, we do have um, folks taking the exam in other countries as well. So you can see we've had a, folks from are in over 95 other countries as well. It's not just the U.S. exam. Um all right. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to talk to you a bit about why certification is important. I think it's important to have that kind of baseline before we talk about specifically about our certification. So there is a, a school of thought that, you know, what defines a um, profession is three components, and sometimes it's referred to as the three legs of the stool of any profession. So the idea is that every profession really needs to have all three of these things. So the first is accreditation. Um, so accreditation is the peer review and approval of an organization that would be a company, you know, a university. It's not people. People are not accredited. It's always an organization. So in um, public health, we have accreditation, CEF accreditation. I know you all are familiar with that. Health departments can be accredited. Um, we so we we've have accreditation in public health now. Degrees, we absolutely have degrees. We've had them for over a hundred years. Um, pu specific public health degrees. Um, so there's always been a, a strong foothold in um, academia with public health, and certainly you all are probably earning a degree. Um, but what we haven't had um, across the board is licensure certification. So certification, as opposed to accreditation, is for individuals. So uh, people are licensed, people are certified, organizations are accredited. So there, there is a bit of a difference. We haven't had that um, in public health. And so for a long, long while, there's really been a movement to professionalize the field of public health. Um, so, you know, as you all know, public health tends to be under-resourced, under-prioritized. We're always fighting to, you know, get, get what we need. Um, and I think public health should be the first thing funded because it's, the, you know, the best way to keep people healthy. 
Um, so the idea is if we really professionalize the field, could we really change things? And a lot of people think we could. So um, the conversation actually goes back way to the, actually before the 1980s, I have a drive um, you know, on my computer where I have old white papers and journal articles. And it's kind of interesting. It's kind of the same conversation we're having now. Um, so there's been a lot of discussion dating way, way back. And the CDC has made calls for professional certification. The U.S. Surgeon General's office has made calls for it. Lots of discussion. There's been think tanks and you know, white papers written, et cetera. Um, and then finally, um, in 2005, two organizations came together. It was um, ASPH and APHA came together and said, enough talk. Like we, if anybody's going to make it happen, we just need to, to move on this idea that's got a lot of support. So they created the National Board of Public Health Examiners. First exam was in 2008. And here we are. So there's been a, a long history behind the idea of public health certification. So one question that we get um, pretty often, so I thought I'd just go ahead and throw this out here, is you know, if you're getting a degree, why do you need a certification? So for one thing, they measure very, very different things. They work nicely together, but they're different. So usually when you have a degree, it means you completed a curriculum, um, you know, and you have you you have gained a body of knowledge. Um, you get a degree, and then usually that degree doesn't go away, right? You have it forever. You finish it, and then you're done. You always have that degree. Certifications, on the other hand, it's really less about how you got there. It's more about your competence to do a job. Um, it's very focused on, very, very focused on practice. And certifications, um, it's implied that you have to stay certified through some kind of continuing education. So if you have a certification, it should um, renew periodically, unlike a degree. So they really do work quite differently. And there's so many examples, um, and this is just a few of them that um, I think we're accustomed to, but in public health, because it's still a bit of a new idea, sometimes people think, well, you know, if I have a degree in public health, why do I need a certification? But think about the person that does your taxes. Um, I can tell you they almost certainly have an accounting degree. It's really hard to have your CPA without an accounting degree. But they don't just have an accounting degree. They also get their CPA. Those things really work together. Um, they measure different things, um, and they they just um, it's sort of the norm in at least in the tax world. Board certified physicians, same thing as they have an MD or a DO, but they're board certified in some specialty area. Lots and lots of other examples I can give you, but it's it's pretty much um, it's pretty common. Um, so so many other professions. And so in public health, I think that's where we're going to, we're going to go. And I think it will be more normal for folks to graduate with both a degree and a certification. So why get certified? Um, so I, I, um, what we find, we ask folks um, when they apply to get certified, because we just love to see their reasons. Why are they getting certified? And what we found is um, it kind of goes from one end to the other, and then there's a lot of in between. We have folks that get certified because they believe it's important for public health is to be recognized as a field. They want to promote the field of public health. They think it's good for public health, and so they get certified for that reason. But we do have folks who get certified because they think it's going to help their career. Um, is it's going to make them stand out? It's going to help them with, you know job applications, um, advancement, et cetera. And then a lot of people, it's both or in between. So um, it's interesting to see the different motivations and they're all valid. That's absolutely fine. Um, so we have a video on our website, but when I started this presentation, I forgot to hit the little thing that says share the sound. Um, so I think I'm gonna scoot through this, but afterwards I'll send you all um, a link where you can watch this I mean, I can try it, but I'm just afraid the sound's going to be too muted. Um, but it, what we did is we brought in um, the six or seven CPHs um, into our office, and we just asked them one question. We didn't, you know, prep them or anything. We just asked them, why did you get your certification? And it's really interesting to hear their answers. And I think that they, you know, if you listen to them, they'll sort of resonate with you all because they came from very different perspectives and all kind of ended up in the same place. Um, so this video is right on our homepage, so I'll make sure that you all have a, a link to it as well. 
Um, so there are, we do get the question often, um, you know, if I'm looking for a job, is the CPH going to help me? So my answer is, my answer is, I don't know, because there's a lot of employers in public health and there's what half a million jobs, right? In public health. And I can't, I just can't in good conscience answer that question for an individual circumstance. Um, it does depend on the employer. It does depend on the job. It depends on a lot of things. Um, what we're finding, um, we have a number of schools and programs that require the CPH. They require their students to take the CPH before they graduate. And what we're finding is in those areas of the country where those schools are, the employers are really paying attention to CPH because they're seeing them. Um, they're seeing people graduate their CPH and thinking this is really useful. So it also it does depend to a certain extent where you are, how your employer is going to view the CPH. Um, but it's possible you're going to find some employers, um, you know, wherever you are that haven't seen the CPH. We're still a kind of a new kid on the block in certification, but that's OK. Just because they don't know that specific certification potentially doesn't mean they don't understand the value of certification in general. So there have been a number of studies done by the Institute of Credentialing Excellence and Gallup Strata um, looking at the value of certifications. And what they have found is that even if the employer doesn't know a specific certification, they realize that having employees that are certified is a really um, strong um, attribute. Because if you have a certification, it means that you had the wherewithal to sit for and pass a standardized exam, um, that you want to continue growing in your field by the recertification process, and that you're committed you know, to whatever you're doing, whatever your profession is. Those are really good things. So if an employer sees you have a certification, it's it's going to be you know an enhancement to your your resume. So um, so it's it's never going to hurt you. It's always going to help. Um, so we have just have a couple slides here and, and make sure you all get to copy these slides. But just shows that there's uh, very high um, positive attributes to having a certification. So, but we also do want to know specifically about the CPH. Of course, we care a lot about that. Um, so we do a number of things. We keep an eye on, you know, where folks are coming from when they get certified. We also look at employers that are requiring the certification. So one, this is just one example. Um, we partner with ASPPH um, that has a job site, Public Health Jobs, um, and the employers there can tag the job, say they requir require or prefer the CPH. Um, and we just kind of watch that and see the trends change. And it's like this screenshot, it's just a snapshot at one moment in time. But what we had is a number of organizations like academia, nonprofits, for-profits, like Car Carnival Cruise Line often looks for CPHs, which I always think is interesting, but it makes a ton of sense. Um, so we just look at, at the different types of employers that are actively see seeking CPHs. And we expect that this trend is gonna continue to grow. All right, so I'm going to talk to you now about the um, certification process. So it's basically three different steps. One is determine your eligibility. Um, two, um, what it what the exam is all about um, and how you prepare for it. And then three, how you maintain your certification. So for the eligibility, it's very important when you have a certifying body is that you set eligibility standards. Um, so partly because we don't want the exam to be the single um, at thing that determines if somebody's certified or not. The, the entire credentials should speak for who you are um, and your competence and not just the exam itself. But also because we frankly don't want people to take the exam and, and fail. That does not help us. It doesn't help you know those candidates. We set our eligibility standards high enough that we believe that most people are at least partway prepared. Um, I'd say most people study at least a little, some people study a lot, but nobody's starting from scratch because they meet our eligibility standards. So, you know, if you all are in school or if you're teaching, you're in an environment where you're really immersed in public health right now, you're partway there. You might be halfway there, you might be three quarters way there being ready to take the exam. Um, so specifically, all right. So we have a couple different uh, eligibility um, pathways. Um, it, it's just a matter of how you get to the point where you take the exam. But once you're approved, no matter your pathway to eligibility, 
It's the same exam, same credentials. So it really doesn't matter how you um, become eligible. It's just how you happen to apply. Um, so our first kind of um, criteria is if you're an alumni, so if you graduated from a CEPA credit school program, you can take the exam. Um, if you are um, a student of a CEPA credit school program, you can take the exam as soon as your school says that you are ready. We leave in that criteria, we leave it up to the schools to decide when you can take the exam. And it's only because we don't want students like literally walking in the door of their degree program and taking the exam and not passing. Again, we don't want you not to pass. We want you to, to pass the exam. Um, and so your school will determine whether you're they think you're ready or not. A lot of schools um, require that their candidates um, have completed the foundation of their degree program, you know, the, or the core. Um, so it's it's really up to your school how they determine what what is enough um, as far as your preparation. Um, so we also have um, eligibility for folks that have not attended a CEPA credit school or program. We call it, it's actually our work experience. It just doesn't fit right there. Our work experience criteria. So it's anybody who has a um, graduate level degree that's not CEPA accredited and they have three years of work experience in public health. And then we also have um, a criteria for folks who have a bachelor's degree in any area and five years work experience in public health. So. Um, again, how, however you apply, it does not matter to us. Um, you'll, you'll end up in the same place. All right, so um, you can, so usually when you're trying to determine whether you're eligible or not, you can always just reach out to us and ask us, tell us, you know, send us your resume and we'll give you an opinion. Um, and you were usually pretty close, but if you apply and for some reason, especially if you're not applying as an alumni or student, um, if your application is not approved, um, if it's declined, then we will refund your your funds. Um, so I, th I think just um, review our eligibility criteria, reach out if you have questions, but if worse comes to worse, we'll refund your application fees. So you don't, we'd like to say you don't need to worry too, too much about it. Okay, so applying um, for the CPH. So everything happens in the same portal. Um, so we try not to bounce you around too much. So what you'll do is you'll go to our website, it's mbpg.org and you go to get certified and there's a little drop down menu. Um, and the last option is um, to apply um, for the exam. So you'll select that and that is the place where you will come back to for everything. So after you pass the exam, that's where you get your score reports. When you're ready to recertify after you're credentialed, that's where you'll come back. So you'll kind of live in the, the same place once you're certified. Um, so the application itself is pretty simple. We really try not to ask any questions we don't have to ask, um, especially if you're applying as an alumni or student. There's not a whole lot you tell us. You basically contact information, a um, little bit about your degree program, and that's about it. So it doesn't take very long to apply. Um, so our goal is to have everybody approved within two weeks. Um, so if you go past two weeks and you're feeling anxious, just reach out to us, please send us an email and we'll, you know, remind somebody for waiting on a review or whatnot, but don't, don't worry. It's fine. If you have to reach out and ask us to kind of make sure your application is moving along, but usually it is well within two weeks, as soon as your application is approved, you will get a set of scheduling instructions from our testing partner, measure learning. And the a message will say, you know, you've been approved. Here is how you schedule your exam. It gives you all the instructions. However, you can you can take the exam right away. I'm going to show you some statistics on how you know how much studying people do. But if you feel like you're ready and you want to go ahead and just take it, fine. You can take it within 72 hours, sometimes even sooner. Um, however, if you need more time, you're not ready. You know you want to study more. Maybe something happened in like your life and it's just not a good time. You can wait as long as you want. Um, unlike a lot of certifying bodies that you know give you three months, six months to take the exam, and then there's a penalty um, if you take it after that. There's no penalty. You will just sit in our system until you're ready. We consider folks who are eligible to be always eligible. So you can wait as long as you want. So there's no pressure. All right. Um, so when you apply, it's one fee 
for the application and the exam. So to get certified, it's only one fee. You don't have to pay again when you take the exam. Um, so our um, regular price is $385. Um, but we also, you know, want to make it affordable to folks. So um, we partner with lots and lots of different types of organizations. Um, so, and if you select one of these and you're affiliated with them, then the price will automatically adjust. So, and I actually have too many, I can't even fit on a screen. We have so many partnerships. Um, so if you go to our website, there is a page called fees and discounts. Um, and you can scroll through that and select the ones and then the price will adjust if you're eligible for any of these. So we do want you to take advantage of that if you can. So we test all year long. We do not have testing windows. Um, so quite literally any day of the year, if you wanna test, you can take the exam. There's um, no blackout periods um, for getting certified. So to take the exam, you've got actually two options. Um, you can either take our exam through a computer-based testing center. And I know you all have gone to these before for other um, exams. Um, it's the same idea. We've got 1,400 testing centers. So there, um, you know, there's quite a few of them. But there's a place on our website under our FAQs where you can actually search for West, where testing centers are by zip code. Um, and so if you want to see if there's a testing center near you, you just go to that um, you, you just go to that page and type in your zip code and it'll show you where the closest testing centers are. So I'd say just barely under half of our candidates go to a computer-based testing center. Um, I think a lot of times they just want to not have to worry about what if my computer doesn't work? Because if you go to a testing center, there's people there that should make sure the computers work. Um, and it kind of takes a little of the you know, stress of your own, using your own personal technology out of the testing process. Um, but there are um, a little over half of our folks want to test by live online proctor. So what happens with live online proctor is you have to have a private space. You can't have people running around, uh, you know, that could potentially help you with the exam. Um, you have to have a computer or PC, a laptop or PC. So no, no tablets or phones. Um, you have to have a, well, obviously a screen and a mic and a camera um, and high speed internet. Um, but most of us have that for, you know, for work. Um, so um, you can certainly test online if you want to. So what happens is they'll send you instructions, you log in to Zoom, a proctor joins you, and then they are kind of with you during the testing process and to assist you if you need any help. Um, we don't care whether you choose to test by a computer-based testing center or live online proctor. It's truly a personal preference, whatever works better for you. Um, so it's, it's completely your choice. Um, so one thing that we've changed, it's not too recently, but a couple of years ago is, um, once you submit your answers for the exam, you will know instantly if you pass or failed, which is great. You don't need to like go home and stress about it. Um, you'll know right away if you pass or failed by the next morning, um, you can log into the same place where you applied and you can pull down your whole score a report that shows you how you did across each of our exam areas, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, so, so you have, you know, by overnight, you'll have access to your actual scores as well. All right. So let's talk about the exam. The exam itself is 200 multiple choice questions. You get a four hour window. So it's a pretty, you know, big chunk of time, um, but it, it it's, sounds like a really big exam, and it is a pretty big exam. It's public health's a pretty broad field. There's a lot that we have to test on, um, but I think this might make, make you feel a little bit better, is the average time that people take within that four-hour window is just under three hours. Um, so what that tells me is that we give enough time on the exam that people can take their time. You know, you if you're the average candidate, you will have time to review your answers and think about, you don't have to rush. We never want somebody to not pass because they were rushing. Um, so most people take well under the four hour window. And if you do have um, a medical disability, um, we do have offer accommodations um, such as time and a half on the exam as well. So if you are in a circumstance where you need more than four hours, that is absolutely fine as well. 
All right, so um, the scores on your exam, so you will see them, obviously. Um, so if you're applying as a student or alumni, um, your school will have access to your scores. Not everybody at your school, but most schools and programs have, I don't know, one, two, three people who have access to the scores. It's because a lot of schools and programs use um, the scores as either part of their accreditation um, process or because they, they can really assess it helps them to assess how well are they teaching um, the um, courses by comparing student performance across our exam. Um, if you're applying through our work experience criteria, then um, nobody would have access to your scores except for you and our staff. All right, so um, we realize that everybody's worried about taking an exam, by and large, folks are going to be nervous about it. Um, you know, it can be a little nerve wracking and just just the whole experience. So this slide also maybe will provide a little comfort is that um, over time, um, our pass rate has been over 80 percent. Um, and it's actually very the average is close to 85 percent right now. And last year um, for that year itself, our pass rate was 88 percent. So the vast majority of people that take the exam do pass on the first attempt. And again, I think it's because our eligibility requirements are set so high that people start off, like I said, partially, mostly ready to pass the exam. And over time, we also have better, better and better study resources. So people are a bit more able to prepare um, to sit for the exam. So hopefully this will, most take a little bit of um, the angst out of sitting for the CPH exam. So once you um, pass the exam, um, we will publish on our website, um, we do publish the names of everybody who is in active status. Um, so once somebody laps or if they fail, they do not show up on our search, but you can search for people that have um, taken the exam and are in active status on our website, but no contact information. It's just um, name, rank, CPH number. And we do this because employers often want to verify um, exam status. Uh, we will also mail you a certificate in the mail. You can hang it on your wall. And we'll also send you a little lapel pin and a packet of information. And we'll send you a customized URL. It's a digital certificate. And these are actually pretty cool. Um, so I say, you know, how many people actually come to our offices nowadays or, you know, a lot of us are virtual, um, but you can take this customized URL and put it in your LinkedIn profile or your email signature, and then folks can click on it and learn more about your CPH. So um, unfortunately, there are some people that are not going to pass the exam um, on their first attempt. So we do allow folks to retake the exam. Um, Right now, we do not have a limit on how often or when. Um, it's because we offer multiple versions of the exam at any time. So if a candidate goes in, takes the exam, retakes it a few weeks later, they'll get different questions. And so it's fine if they want to retake the exam. Um, so if you do need to retake the exam, you don't need to be verified again. You just pay $150 um, retake fee, and then you can sit for the attempt as soon as you want to. So we're gonna talk about what's on the exam. Um, so um, the term I'm gonna use um, often is our content outline. A lot of certification bodies refer to what's on their exam, sort of like a map of all the topics as their content outline. Um, so how do we decide what's on the exam? So like most certification bodies, we don't sit around in a room and just decide. I mean, we might have ideas and, um, you know, suggestions, but we actually have to follow the evidence of what people are doing in public health. So a certification program is supposed to verify the competence of the workforce, that the people who are certified are competent to do their jobs. Therefore, we have to test people on what they're doing, not you know, what do we wish they were doing or what are they gonna be doing in 10 years? That's different. We have to test them on current public health tasks. So the way that we and most of the certification bodies come up with the list of um, tasks is we do a job task analysis and it's job task analysis. And I can do a whole 45 minute presentation on this and I won't, uh, but the, the really short version is it's a survey 
that lists all the possible things or the most likely things that a professional does. And they're usually asked to rate those things in terms of how frequently and how critical those things are to their job. Um, and you register that survey and get as many people as possible to take that survey. And then you, we have a psychometrician that helps us um, come up with the results and determine our content outline. So the content outline, we break into 10, we'll call them domains. It's like, think of it like chapters in a book. So one of our chapters is program management um, in the, the bottom left. Um, but within program management, we also have, we have a series of tasks and I'll show you an example um, in a couple slides from now. Um, but these are just the topics. These are the buckets. Um, so this is within it, there is more detail. But we have to break it down like this, because otherwise, if we just showed you 150 tasks, it would be overwhelming and just not the way the human brain works. Um, so we we divided it into these buckets. People can kind of wrap their head around the, you know, the subtopics. Um, you'll note that all the domains are 10 percent each. They're all equally weighted. So I can tell you from experience is that. People worry about evidence-based approaches to public health, which is epidemiology and biostatistics. They worry about that domain, um, but it's the same 10% as all the other domains. And so it, if that you know there is a domain that you're worried about, like evidence-based approaches to public health, please don't neglect the other ones. Um, you, they're equally important. Um, so we hope that you will be judicious when thinking about how you wanna prepare for the exam and not focus all your efforts on one that you're particularly concerned about. And again, I'll give you a little bit more study tips, but I just wanted to point out that they're all equally weighted. Um, and part of the reason why um, you, know, you need to think that way is because our passing score is based on overall scores, not each domain. We do not have a passing score per domain. So truly you can do poorly on a domain or two as long as you do well enough in the others. So don't let one domain, you know, you think that's gonna be the, the end of it if you're struggling with one of them. Um, just one little tip I'm gonna give you is when you take the exam, just make sure you answer all the questions, even if you have no idea. There might be some questions in there where you think, I just really don't know. And, and you know, eventually your, your exam time is going to end. You are better off guessing than you are leaving it unanswered um, because we don't penalize you for wrong answers. All we do is we simply add up the right answers. And at least if you guess, you have a 25% chance of getting it right. Every question has four answer options. So guess rather than leaving it unanswered. All right, I'm gonna skip those because I'm gonna just go ahead. I really wanna spend a little more time on study resources. Um, so we've um, been really fortunate to um, work with some great partner organizations to provide some study resources. We put some together some new things recently as well because um, we do want people to feel confident about um, taking the exam and for them to feel like they've got tools at their disposal. Um, so recently, we actually did a present no, survey. It was it was this year. I think it was the spring. And we asked a couple of questions. I just wanted to share the answer with you. Um, when did you start to prepare for the CPH exam? And you can see that the most common answer was less than three months. So here's what I think is going on, because um, I've heard this so many times, is that a lot of times people decide, okay, you know, federal agencies will have a bunch of employees that want to get certified or, you know, a school will be encouraging their students to get their certification so that we have these cohorts. And I've heard that they often organize um, review sessions and they break it down like one domain at a time. Um, so I think that's partly why less than three months is one of the most common responses because it's 10 domains, that would be 10 weeks. Um, and so I think that they're going through that process and taking the exam. And the other is because it's, there's a certain point truly where if you're really doing intensive studying and then you don't take the exam, you're going to forget, start to forget a bit. So I think people also are not, um, uh, you know, waiting too, too long for they to take the exam and they're trying to take advantage of the fresh knowledge um, that they have. That said, there are people that go back to school or, you know, they might take some classes, they might do some other things, um, and that's fine too, but 
Um, just under three months is the most common uh, amount of time people spend preparing. And um, this one's a little different though. You can see that there's a lot of folks spend, you know, um, 30, 40, 50 hours um, preparing for the exam. So I think it's just during that intensive period. Um, so how you should prepare, I don't know because um, we all have different study um, styles. So personally, um, when I was in school, I could never cram at all. I could not stay up all night. I was just a mess. I was much better getting a good night's sleep and going in and not knowing the material, but being you know, lucid and having enough sleep. Um, but there are people that do really well just cramming for an exam. Um, some people just need to go to class and write everything down and review their notes. And that's how they do it. You know, you're in, you're in school, you've been in school, you know what your process is. So, you know, I just um, really focus on what do you think works best for you? And that is how you should prepare for the exam. Um, that said, I'm going to show you some of the resources we have, though, that can assist you. So if you go back to our website under Get Certified drop down, there's a page called Study Resources. Um, and so this page is divided into two pieces. One is self-assessment. Um, that's how you figure out what do I need to study? And then there's resources to help you to prepare. So um, there are a couple of tools in the self-assessment um, so we have some studying tips that are just probably things that you knew, you know, like get a good night's sleep before you get the exam and, you know, eat protein and make sure you're hydrated, all that, but it's still good to re review it. It's good just to remember to keep those good study habits. Um, our content outlines there, we do have some sample questions, um, which I'll mention in a second, some practice exams and a personal action plan. Um, which is a, a way for you to chart out how are you gonna prepare for the exam? It's just a way for you to get organized. And then we do have a number of um, other tools that have been provided by different organizations. So what I'm gonna do now is go through in a little more detail and I'm gonna walk you through how we recommend you think about approaching the process to prepare to take the exam. Um, so the first is, our content outline. So when I remember when I said that we have domains and there's topics within the domains, this is a great example. So we have 10 of these. So prog program management, these are the tasks. If you go to our content outline, the website, you can see all 10 of the domains and all, all of the tasks that fall under those domains. Um, it's long, it's about eight pages, I think. Um, I don't recommend that you go through with a highlighter and write, you know, make notes on this or anything at first. I would just skim it. And what you're going to find is some of the domains you're going to think, oh, yeah, I just took class in that. Or, oh, yeah, I've done this for a job. Some of the domains are going to feel really familiar. Some of the domains you're going to think, I don't know what they're talking about. Um, and then some will be in between. And so I think that's a really great place to start in thinking, how do I want to prepare? Where should I start? You might want to start with the domains where you just have no foundation whatsoever. Or maybe you have a foundation in all of them, then start with the ones where you're, they're feeling less familiar. Um, so sample questions, we have a few on our website. It's just a PDF, it's only about eight. It's not so you get a sense of what's on the exam. It's literally so you can see what typically what our exam questions look like, just so you can start to get familiar with the style and the tone. Um, but um, then you can move on to the mini exams. We have two practice exams. These are exams comprised of um, questions that we pulled out of our item bank. Um, we retired them. Maybe they've been exposed, you know, used too many times. Um, so we pulled them out of our item bank and we had some um, items that had gone through review, um, hadn't been tested, but we really wanted to build these practice exams. So there's two of them. Um, they're each 50 questions. And remember our full exam is 200 questions and four hours, right? So the 50 questions mini exam, I would say give yourself an hour to take that mini exam because you'll be taking the questions at the same pace as the real CPH exam so that when you go to the exam, you won't panic about the time. You'll know what it is like to take the questions at that pace. Um, so what's neat about the um, practice exam is, um, so in the background here, um, that's what it pretty much approximate what it, it looks like to take the exam. 
Um, but when you finish, and you can you can do these as many times as you want. They're free. You can you know take them over and over and whatnot. But when you finish, you will get an assessment for each domain. So for evidence-based approaches to public health, for communications, et cetera, it will give you a rating. It'll either tell you that domain is a possible strength, satisfactory, or possible weakness. If you get possible strength, that's obviously good. That means you did well in that domain. If you got a satisfactory, that means it's good. Um, you know, it's a little closer to the pass um, score, but it's still good if you get satisfactory. Um, and maybe you want to study a little bit in the ones you have satisfactory, um, but, you know, those aren't the most worrisome. If you have domains where you um, get a possible weakness, my recommendation is that's where you need to think about starting when you're preparing for the exam. So um, if you take the mini exam and you have just a couple possible weaknesses, everything was a possible possible strength and satisfactory, you've got a good shot at passing the exam. Um, obviously, there is a correlation, but I cannot promise you that doesn't exactly translate into the full exam because they're different questions, um, but it's a good indicator that you'll do well on the exam. All right, so um, other study resources. Once you figure out, okay, I need to double down and work on these domains. A um, couple of years ago, AS PPH put together webinars in each domain. They had faculty come in and the webinars, they're all about two-ish hours in length. I think they're about an hour and a half of the faculty talking about the domains, what they think you need to know. Um, and then there's some Q&A at the end. They're all on YouTube. We get the best comments about these webinars and they're free and they're on demand. So if you need to, you know, get some more background information to beef up in some of the domains, these webinars are a great way to do that. Um, there are several study guides um, that were developed by other organizations. Um, so on the left is the study guide developed by Springer Publishing. Um, it's lots and lots of practice questions. Um, some of the schools that require the CPH exam use that one. Um, the one on the right um, with the highlighters, that was published by APHA. I, I like that one because it's different than the others because it actually has a chapter on each domain. So again, if you feel like, okay, I need to learn more about this domain, this one um, you know, has a chapter you can read on each, each of the domains. So it's a just a really good brief um, on the domains and it does have practice questions. And then there's a third study guide that I don't have a good icon for. Um, it was originally developed by ASPPH, and it's an online study guide um, that has, it's very interactive and has a, a good source of practice questions. Um, we also periodically do review courses. Um, so um, typically an organization will come to us and say, you know, will you host a review session at my conference? Or, um, you know, can we get you to come in and do it for these employees? Um, so a lot of times we don't put it up on our website because it's closed it's just for that organization. But if we do have review sort courses that are open um, to the public, then we absolutely will put them on our website. Um, APHA, we're actually going to host one with APHA. So the Saturday and Sunday before APHA next month, we're going to have a review course. And the good news is for you all is I believe in January, we, for the first time in a while, we're going to host our own review course. Um, it's going to be virtual um, and it'll be about 10 weeks and we'll schedule it and record them. And um, so, you know, you can participate live or you can just watch the recordings, but we're going to do a whole fresh set um, of review sessions on each of the domains. All right. So last thing we're going to go through is the recertification process, because this is so important. It's just hopefully you'll get your CPH and pass that exam and you know, relax for a while. But um, again, certifications, you need to maintain a certification. It does end um, unless you recertify. So you do need to go through a recertification process. Um, so our process is pretty simple. Every two years, you'll need to report 30 recertification credits. Um, but our process is actually different than a lot of certification bodies. Um, and basically in two ways. So our philosophy is that public health people, you know, should find their own way to the ways to stay current in the field that makes sense to them. Um, so we don't want to, we don't want to dictate specifically what should you do. We need to have some guidelines, but we also don't want to be too prescriptive. So for one, we do not have pre-approved providers. And what that means is if you go to a conference, 
and the topic is public health, it'll count for certification. We don't need to tell you which conferences you can go to. You can figure that out to your, for yourself. Um, the other is that we allow for professional development activities, which is pretty different than most certifying bodies. Um, continuing education is a term that like in our eyes is sort of the didactic, the training you go and you consume, you know, knowledge through webinars, um, training programs, conferences, et cetera. Of course, we'll count those. They, they count for certification. However, that there are ways that people can develop to, you know, um, in the field in other ways. Um, so examples are if you are doing things like writing a grant um, or peer reviewing a journal article or publishing, or if you're uh, doing public speaking, um, if you're teaching a course, those things will count towards cert certification. The one that I personally really love is the volunteer leadership service, um, because that's so important to public health um, is you know the service component. And I just love reviewing the applications and seeing all the incredible things public health professionals are doing with other organizations. So, you know, if you get certified and you get to the point where you think, oh, I don't have enough credits, I, you know, I don't know what I'm going to do, please contact us and we'll kind of talk you off the ledge a little bit because unless you've been living under a rock, you're probably doing plenty of things that will count towards certification. Um, so I'm going to skip all of that. Um, but I do want to mention when you get your certification, we really, it's important to us to build a community out of CPHs. Um, so we do lots of things for, for CPHs. And just one example is, uh, we have this really great book club. We have like 1400 members of it. Um, and we read, I don't know, six, eight books a year. And if you actually go to our website, um, and see all the books we've read over the years. And it's just just a really great way um, for CPHs to interact. And we have a very active LinkedIn group, um, several thousand CPHs there, and they're always sharing jobs and opportunities and just lots, a lot of interesting stuff. Um, just a good way uh, for CPHs to get to know each other and to collaborate. All right, so I think I covered everything that I wanted to. So I'm going to leave this slide up here just for a second. Um, so you all have our email address. So obviously, if you have any questions, please um, feel free to email us or call us. And we'd love to talk to you. And now I'm going to pause and see if you all have any questions. Uh, hi, Allison. Thank you so much. Um, this was really interesting. I'm definitely interested in the certification. I don't know if this is a question for you, or I don't know if a Dr. Taylor can answer this, but you mentioned that students could um, actually take the certification before graduating. Mm -hmm. Does anyone know what the specific policy at ODU would be? Um, Katie, I will have to look into it, but I think you would have to meet all the credentials for um, for uh, for graduating. Um, but um, Dr. Um, Altair may have a little bit more information um, since he's been in it a little longer, but we can definitely look into that. I can um, get that information from you. I, I can send him a note. Thank you. Does anybody else have a question for Allison? I covered it all. Um, I have a few questions, if no one else does. Um, okay, so you mentioned that certification, uh, it's kind of like having getting CEs. Well, you do have to get your CEs with those things that you mentioned. Um, What's an incentive, obviously, beyond um, learning more of public health? Is there any other incentive to stay certified um, beyond, obviously, you know, learning more about the public health field? Um, for somebody who might think, you know, well, I got the job, I have my CTH, and that helped me get the job, I don't need to stay certified. Is there anything that you can say? on that? Yeah. Um, so, well, I look at my, I have a couple certifications and for one thing, I like, I'm proud 
that, you know, I have certifications and I, I wouldn't want to let them lapse. I mean, I worked hard to, to get them. Um, I really don't ever want to take either of the exams again. <laughs> oh, that's so, a good question too. So if you do let it lapse, do you have to retake the exam? Is there like a, so I was once uh, nationally certified as a pharmacy technician and they had like kind of a grace period for like a year where you could just pay like extra basically and present your uh, CEs within a certain window and they would get you back in. Is there something like that or? Ours is, yeah, ours is like that. So you have to go a while, a couple of years um, left before you have to take the exam again. I think it's actually five years, but you have to report makeup credits. Um, so it's better just not to let it lapse because then you're kind of in a scramble to figure out the makeup credits. But um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, it's, it's, to me, it's less about like, in my case, it's less about my job. It's more about who it says I am. And I, you know, I feel like I'm setting an example for people that are coming behind me. I mean, I've been in the nonprofit world forever and it's important for me to set an example. Um, and um, one of my certifications, I'm a certified association executive. And I think it's great that the world sort of knows, oh, there is sort of a, you know, uh, a body of knowledge behind association management. They might not otherwise realize that. Um, and I, you know, I think that's true of the CPH because you're saying, I work in public health. It has a certification. I think it makes a really powerful statement. The other thing, and so I know I'm giving all examples about me, but um, her, so <laughs> whenever my certification deadlines roll around, on one hand, I'm like, oh no, I gotta, you know, start thinking about earning all these credits. On the other hand, it's great because I have that sort of that reason why I have to take a pause on all the day-to-day -day stuff that just never goes away. And I do have to do some webinars and I do have to, you know, attend some conferences. And I really appreciate it because I feel like it has forced me to grow in the field. And, you know, it's sort of like a carrot and a stick, but I think it can be a pretty powerful thing. Yeah, those are great. And everything you said is great. I just like to play devil's advocate and think about what some reasons maybe people yeah. wouldn't. Um, we did have a comment in the chat. Someone said, I'm interested in pursuing data science analysis with public within public health. Is this something that would help me in that field in the future? Which I know, I know people in the data science field that have their CPH. So I would say that yes, but Allison, yeah. if you can... Yeah, and part of the, the reason why we developed the CPH the way we did is that no matter what your specialty area um, is, you have to know, I'm going to say a little bit about a lot of areas, right? We don't expect everybody to be a deep, deep expert in every domain. Um, but that's sort of the whole point is that if you're in data science and you have your CPH, that means you also know a little bit about health communications and behavioral science and environmental health, you kind of have to, to pass the exam. You have to know more than your special area. And it's sort of this vision we have is, wouldn't it be great if the people working in data science could talk to the health policy person and to a certain extent, they're gonna speak the same language. They have a common baseline. Um, you know, they, they have a body of knowledge that's, um, you know, common among them. So I think that says a lot about anybody, no matter where you are, it means that you're conversant and you you do have a good grasp of the, the whole spectrum of public health. Thank you. Um, I have two more quick questions, I'm sorry. Uh, do you know, have you heard, would you say like most jobs, let's say somebody is already in a public health job, uh, if their jobs pay for them to get the exam? We're seeing a lot of health departments right now. I think it's infrastructure funds, but we've so I just had a webinar earlier today for a health department and they're paying for their staff to get um, certified. Um, we've had a couple of nonprofits we partner with. Um, this year we've done review courses for them and they're paying for their staff to get certified. So it's definitely an upward trend. Um, we have one health department and they didn't pay originally. And then all of a sudden I got this flurry of emails from people saying, can you send me the receipt? Cause I can get reimbursed now. And mm -hmm. that's cool. <laughs> so it's great to see it's, you know, it started off very individualized and now it's, be it feels like it's becoming very institutionalized in a good way. 
Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, I feel like you had to have said this and I might have missed it. So I'm sorry if so. Um, did you say what score you needed to pass? No, so we don't we don't publish the score because um, the problem is we have multiple versions of the exam being administered at any given time. And because they're different questions, they're inherently going to be a little easier, a little harder than each other. We use something called equating. It's just Google it and it's super fascinating. Actually, I love the whole testing <laughs> process. Um, but we use equating to make sure that a harder exam has a slightly lower pass score. And so if you take an easier version of the exam, the bar kind of gets raised, you have a higher pass score. But because we have different pass scores for every form, we don't publish the passing score because it would be really confusing to somebody who says, well, you know, I thought it was going to be X, but I got it Y and I didn't pass. It's right. So if we only had one form, we would publish it, but we, we can't do that. Gotcha. So, but the best I can tell you is the the mini exam. You can, you know, if you take the mini exam, I think, or one yeah, of the good gauge, two, it'll give you a good sense. So, like I said, if you get mostly, um, you know, satisfactory and possible strengths, then you'll have a pretty good sense you would have passed or not. Awesome. Does anybody else have any questions for Allison? I'm not sure who can answer this, but is ODU a CEPH accredited school? Yeah, I think we are, right, Dr. Taylor? Yes, yes, we are. Because we always have to meet those in our classes, so I'd assume so. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and that, that will be maintained throughout any changes coming in the future. We have a specific uh, accreditation um, person for that, Mrs. Ewers, so yes. Cool, awesome. Okay, well, if nobody and, else. Yeah, and, and I'd be Sorry. glad to send you the slides if you want to yeah. share them, absolutely. And I'll send you a link to the video as well. So, yeah. Awesome. Uh, okay, cool. If nobody else has any questions, thank you so much, Allison, for joining us and sharing that information. It was super helpful. Uh, I've been super excited about hearing about it because, yeah, I know a lot of public health leaders who have the certification. So I know we're all super interested in potentially getting